Coming up on Network Africa. Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention call for caution as the continent's COVID-19 case fatality rate is now higher than the global average. European Union urges Ugandan government to investigate alleged abuses against opposition politicians. Plus, a look at what the US-Africa relationship might look like under the new president, Joe Biden. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Layo Adegoke. Africa's COVID-19 case fatality rate is now higher than the global average, which, according to the Africa Centers for Disease Control, is worrying and concerning. Now, that's according to the head of Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, John Nkegasong. The CDC boss says the continent's death rate stands at 2.5% against the global average of 2.2%, and the number of nations recording higher rates is growing. Earlier during the pandemic, Africa recorded lower death rates than the global average, but in the second wave, 21 countries have had a death rate above 3%. They are Sudan, Egypt, Liberia, Mali, Chad, Niger, the Gambia, Tunisia, Eswatini, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Zimbabwe. The continent has so far confirmed 3.3 million COVID-19 cases with 2.7 million recoveries and 81,000 deaths. Now, when the COVID-19 pandemic initially struck, many, many countries began locking down their their nations to slow the spread of the virus. Airports, schools, corporate organizations and shops, businesses were shut down and this undoubtedly had a massive effect on economies and also personal lives of people. Most African governments re responded to the pandemic with strict lockdowns, resulting in severe economic consequences. The impacts have been diverse between countries, the informal and formal sectors, industries and traded products. Now, according to a study published in the Journal of American Medical Association Open Network, the closures and restrictions had significant success, especially here in Nigeria, and it is associated with a decreased rate of COVID-19 infections compared to other countries. Well, joining us now on the program to discuss more on this study is Dr. Daniel Erim. He's the lead author of this research and also Professor Lekon Ayo Yusuf. He's also the co-author of this research. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us on the program. Thank you for having you. us. Well, let me begin with Thank you, you Dr. Erim. You are the lead author of this study. Talk us through the reason for this research and its findings. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, first off, um, going off of the information you presented earlier, we are all aware that all countries have been hit by the virus and are struggling to reduce its impact in one way or another. Some countries have made really huge progress in this regard, like New Zealand and Australia, and others are still trying to get a handle on things like Nigeria. And even more um, pressing for Nigeria, where questions beginning to dominate the global, um, uh, the global space or global conversation about how the, the number of observed COVID-19 cases uh, were controlled and we're now seeing a spike, and what's responsible for this, as well as, uh, more urgencies regarding the second wave in Nigeria. And we felt the need to address this question substantively to inform health policy making um, in the future. And so once the research question was clear regarding the impact of the lockdown, which was Nigeria's primary anti-contagion measure, um, it became a case of um, assembly 
assembly a team of competent experts with demonst demonstrated expertise in health policy research and identifying what data sets we could use to answer the question. Like you have mentioned, but let me just switch to Professor Ayo Yusuf in Pretoria. You know, cases are still on the rise. Rise. We've been told we are now experiencing a second wave that's even more alarming than the first one. I mean, countries are now recording new variants. Is there more to be done in curbing this new wave? You know, what extra efforts should be made by governments and even individuals to avert new lockdowns? Yeah, thank you. Uh, the, uh, the quicker we can get the epidemic under control, uh, the less likely you're going to be getting variants and, of course, uh, getting this uh, subsequent waves. So it is not uncommon in an epidemic of this nature that you would get resurgence as uh, preventive fatigue sets in. So on the part of the government... Uh, government needs clear public health communication on the state of the pandemic, uh, including um, removing any misinformation around uh, the, the state of the pandemic and also vaccination. Secondly, government needs to ramp up the testing capacity so they can isolate the cases very quickly before it spreads and then trace the contacts of the cases for quarantine. So that's a basic ABC for controlling the pandemic. And um, the government also needs to strengthen the health services uh, because for those who eventually then get to hospital, as you probably know, most people will not need hospital care. But if we neglect the healthcare services, even for those who have malaria or any other human, they might even die. Uh, before they even get COVID, because it's very important to stay focused on also strengthening the healthcare uh, services for both COVID-related illness and non-COVID-related. On the population side, there's no magic bullet. Uh, vaccination is going to come, but not now. And even then, we'll wait for a very, for a long time to come. Have to continue this non-pharmacological intervention. Wear your mask diligently as soon as you come out of the house, it's not just about you, it's about the next person to you. You should tell the next person to you, put on your mask because you are safer with that person with a mask on as well. Secondly, continue the social distance, which starts from you deciding whether you actually need to go out. If you don't need to go out, walk from home or stay at home. And if you have to go out, stay at a distance from the next person. And of course, continue to wash your hands as often as you can or otherwise sanitize. Yeah, so this, my next question is for you both, but I like, Professor, since you mentioned, you know, vaccine, we're still in the midst of this pandemic with no, sadly, no end in sight. There's also so much controversy ahead of the arrival of vaccines. Well, how prepared do you think the continent is in receiving and, you know, storing and eventually rolling out to citizens? Professor, I'd like you to answer just before Dr. Erim. Unfortunately, you know, <clears throat> the, the unfortunate situation is developing uh, that uh, the WHO have tried to avoid wherein uh, vaccines become available for the richer countries that could afford them and get into this bilateral agreement. Um, the African countries have gone into this COVAX arrangement to buy in bulk and get enough to Africa. But as things are developing, it seems to me that most of the vaccine doses that have been manufactured as have ended up in high income countries. So of course, uh, we continue to advocate for equitable distribution. So unfortunately, as we see it right now, uh, it is not likely that the majority of uh, the African population will be vaccinated. The best we can probably get and what we're working at is to prioritize healthcare workers who are in the front line of saving lives and we're hoping that in the second quarter of this year, uh, many African countries will be able to get the COVAX uh, en enough doses to this uh, priority population. What is your take on this, as most especially in also in the sensitization of people that will be receiving this vaccine? Most definitely, this is why I talked about the public health communication by government. It has to be prioritized before this vaccines even come. 
as you probably know, in the U.S., they've also experienced a situation where the vaccines are produced. They're actually there, but they are not distributed because people are not taking them up as much as they would have wanted to. So people are refusing to take these vaccines. So we need to already start the sensitization long before because there's a lot of misinformation about what the vaccine is and what is not. All right, Dr. Daniel Erim, I'd like to hear also your take on vaccination in Africa. Uh, thank you very much for the question. I agree completely with what Professor Lekon said. And I'd like to add that late last year, the World Health Organization uh, released a tool called the COVID-19 Vaccine Country Readiness Assessment Tool for all countries to use in a self-reflective way to describe how ready they are for the vaccine in terms of infrastructure, in terms of supply chain management, in terms of uh, cold storage or deep freeze um, facilities, in terms of people's readiness to accept the vaccine. And so when these tools are gathered and collated and assessed, we have a more objective um, answer as to how ready the continent is for the vaccine. Um, there, there are major challenges which uh, Professor Leko has talked about. And I think I would like to emphasize the fact that um, it's important to address misinformation out there. Um, many people have all kinds of concerns about the vaccine and how fast it came out or how fast it was produced and what are the long-term effects since the vaccine was studied for a relatively, a relatively short period of time. Um, a lot of effort is going into spreading the right information that there are no conspiracy theories around this. The vaccines are meant to help protect us when taken correctly. And if we're all committed to this to the, as, uh, to the full extent possible, there's a good chance that life will return to normal as soon as possible. All right, then we'd like to thank you so much, Dr. Daniel Erim and uh, Professor Lekon Ayo Yusuf, lead author and co-author of the research by the uh, Jamal, uh, I beg your pardon, by the Journal of American Medical Association, the COVID-19 research. Thank you so much for your time on Network Africa. Thank you, thank you for having us. I will move on to other COVID-19 stories. Eswatini has extended a partial lockdown that's meant to prevent the spread of coronavirus by another four weeks and has banned the sale of alcohol. The country, previously known as Swaziland and its neighbors to South Africa, where coronavirus cases are surging because of a new COVID-19 variant. Acting Prime Minister Temba Masuku says alcohol sales would be totally banned for the next four weeks. The initial partial lockdown announced two weeks ago had restricted the sale of alcohol just on weekdays. Travel outside the country also remains banned except for medical reasons or work. In the meantime, the Zimbabwean First Lady has invited women in the country to join her for three days of prayer and fasting over the COVID-19 pandemic. Auxilia Menengagwa says she will fast and pray from Thursday until Saturday for Zimbabwe to be spared from further calamity. She also urged women to ensure their families observe COVID-19 safety guidelines to prevent the virus from spreading further. Zimbabwe has lost 879 people to coronavirus, including top government officials, with the most recent death being that of Foreign Minister Tibusiso Moyo. Well, to politics now, the European Union says it is concerned about the continued harassment of politicians and civil society activists in Uganda after last week's general election. This comes after incumbent President Yoweri Museveni, who has been in power since 1986, 
won his sixth elective term. In a statement, the EU Council of Ministers called on the government to restrain its security agencies, investigate allegations of abuses, and bring to account all those responsible for violations. Opposition presidential candidate Robert Kiangulayi, a pop star turned politician known as Bobby White, has been under house arrest in the capital Kampala since Friday after he began disputing the results of the presidential election. EU ministers say the internet shutdown disrupted the work of journalists, observers and polling agents expected to monitor the election on January 14th. Welcome back to the program. U.S. President Joe Biden has reversed the multiple immigration policies made by his predecessor, Donald Trump, including the 2017 travel ban on people from several predominantly Muslim countries. Out of the 17 orders, memorandums and proclamations revealed on Wednesday, six dealt with immigration, mostly an attempt to undo some controversial Trump-era policies. President Biden signed an executive order ending the travel ban on citizens from more than a dozen countries, including Eritrea, Yemen, Nigeria and Sudan. The ban was imposed by former President Donald Trump when he first entered office, criticized as a Muslim ban when it was first revealed. It went on to eventually include some non-majority Muslim nations. Meanwhile, other orders reversed include the Trump administration's stance on climate change. Well, the U.S. has troops stationed in various countries across Africa, and economies are greatly linked through trade and investment. The U.S.-Africa relations under former President Donald Trump was quite a rocky relationship, most especially because Mr. Trump sometimes didn't speak kindly of the continent. Well, on Wednesday, new President Joe Biden, during his inaugural speech on Wednesday, says he will repair America's alliances and engage with the world once again. Well, Africa is waiting to see how the bilateral ties will turn out under a Biden administration. Well, let's get more on this from an African affairs analyst joining us on the program, Achike Chude. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Now, you know, a lot of people believe that Donald Trump disrespected and disregarded Africa while in power. What are your expectations in terms of U.S.-Africa relations under Joe Biden? Yeah, well, we must also, um, looking at, uh, at um, American, what Biden is likely going to do in Africa or for Africa, we must also uh, remember the fact that um, Africa uh, used to be much more of a strategic uh, continent for the United States. Africa no longer, unfortunately, occupies that uh, position, and that is why the Chinese have moved in. Uh, over time and uh, has more or less taken over the uh, economic uh, space in Africa and uh, having a greater engagement uh, with uh, African countries and African leaders. Uh, so uh, from that perspective, we might not expect um, a very heavy uh, involvement uh, by the Biden administration uh, in Africa. Uh, perhaps, um, yes, the issue of administration, I think it's uh, immigration, is one area where I think the uh, Donald Trump our presidency failed the African continent, and I believe that um, uh, Biden is very much aware of that. In fact, uh, prior to the uh, uh, American election, uh, they made statements uh, to, the, to, to the fact that uh, they are going to redress some of uh, the immigration issues that uh, they are disagreed with the Trump, administ uh, the Trump administration. And so you would expect, an, I mean, easing of uh, immigration uh, rules and uh, regulations that make it difficult for people from other countries, especially African countries, uh, to come into the United States. Well, there is hope that African democracy and the economy will be strengthened by its relations with the new U.S. administration. Do you share this optimism as well? Well, I'm not sure that uh, the, um, the Biden presidency will uh, go a very long way in uh, strengthening Ameri the Ameri African economy. Uh, the reality, and uh, that is what a lot of us have been saying, is that uh, the Africa can never be developed unless it is developed by Africans. So we must wean ourselves from this uh, constant uh, belief that um, it will take uh, foreign countries to come to Africa and then make Africa a better place. Uh, we, 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 we are the biggest stake. Uh, we have the biggest stake in Africa. It is our continent, and so we must do everything to make sure that Africa is better. But that is not to say 
that um, other countries cannot engage, other continents cannot engage with the African continent, but they must do that in a way that is meaningful and respectful uh, to uh, the nuances in Africa and to the real needs of uh, Africa. Uh, for so long, um, aids that have been given to African countries have contributed uh, to the death trap that a lot of African countries entered into. And, and so uh, we cannot continue along that line. Well, finally, what would you what what is your assessment of U.S. Africa relations under the Trump administration? You know his legacy with regards Africa. Trump's signature tune has been uh, uh, "Prosper Africa," uh, but we must also say that um, uh, he he has only carried out uh, the constructive development efforts of his predecessors because there is a bipartisan uh, agreement or legislation in the Senate. Uh, in the U.S. Congress uh, that uh, makes it imperative for some level of uh, development in the African continent by any administration that comes on board. And though Trump might not have been very personally involved in it, but he has continued with the constructive uh, you know, uh, development efforts across the African uh, uh, continent. So he has not actually been, been different. All right, then. Mr. Achike Chude, African Affairs Analyst, there speaking to us. Well, an update on the border roll between Ethiopia and Sudan. Ethiopia's military is accusing an unnamed third party of being behind its border dispute with Sudan. Army Chief of Staff General Bihanu Jula said on Wednesday that a third party was behind the Sudanese army's violation of Ethiopia's sovereignty. He warns that Sudan should avoid war traps being set by the unnamed party and resolve the border dispute through negotiations. Clashes between the East African neighbors over the disputed Al Fashaga region have escalated recently after Sudan in late December announced it had regained control of all its territories that were under the control of Ethiopian militias for over 25 years. Ethiopia accuses Sudan of occupying its territories and that's a charge Khartoum has denied. Well, as we end the program today, a young Nigerian boy, Chinonso Eche, has set a world record for the most consecutive soccer ball touches in one minute while balancing a second ball on his head. The 12-year-old, who has become an online sensation, says he's planning to take his skills global when he grows up. A 12-year-old boy from Nigeria who set a world record for the most consecutive soccer ball touches in one minute while balancing a second ball on his head is planning to take his skills global when he grows up. Chinonso Eche from the city of Wari in southern Nigeria has become an online sensation with videos of his tricks attracting thousands of viewers. Inspired by footage of footballers Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo, as well as retired Nigerian midfielder JJ Okocha, Chinoza said he mostly taught himself. Nobody teach me, but my father made impact in my life by showing me some videos of Lionel Messi, Ronaldo, Okocha, and I picked up from there. Chinonso managed 111 football touches in 60 seconds while a second ball balanced on his head, earning him a place in the 2021 edition of the Guinness World Records, the first time it is included in the annual reference book. Before, my friends were cursing me, laughing at me, but when I break a record, my friends said they want to be like me. The boy, now backed by a management company, hopes his talents will turn into an international career. My dream is to become a footballer and international fisherer and travel all over the world. Chinonso's next target is 2,000 consecutive touches while balancing a ball on his head. Best believe you can always achieve your dreams. That's Network Africa for today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Layo Adegoke.